is that once this role is executed, for all we care, uh, the machine that executed this role could go offline forever. It doesn't need to keep state or speak again. Okay. And so for the second step, the role selection mechanism just picks some other party to execute um, role number two. Again, you broadcast a public value and you send some private messages to future roles and so on, right? So you can go offline. Again, the role selection mechanism chooses someone to take to execute role number three. And there's some public value. And again, this machine can go offline. And then you want to compute something from, from kind of this whole behavior. Okay. So usually uh, we kind of abstract away this whole part with the role selection mechanism. Then there's like this very large ground set of parties that's much larger than the number of roles. Um, and this original work, they just considered this very simple scenario where you know the role selection mechanism is assumed to be perfect. So it's assumed to basically select the party uh, uniformly at random. And why is this interesting? So they, they managed to do a lot of cool stuff uh, with this assumption. So uh, if you have worst case corruptions on the ground set of parties, right? Uh, then because the role selection mechanism is uniformly random, these translate into IID uh, random corruptions uh, on the roles, right? Is that is that clear? Um, actually, no. Can you repeat? Mm -hmm. So I don't understand yeah. how it responds to corruptions. Right. So if you corrupt, so if you corrupt parties, right, when they execute some role, they can deviate arbitrarily from from right. whatever the the specification of the role was, right? But since um, parties say, yeah, maybe you corrupt, say, 40% of the parties, okay? Then if you're picking a party uniformly at random to execute some role, there's basically 40% probability that you're going to pick a corrupted party, right? Mm. And these are independent. So every time you execute a new role, you're just going to pick a new uniformly random party. So you always have 40% probability of getting a corrupted party. Okay, okay, got it, got it. Okay. Mm. Okay. All right. Yeah, by the way, I mean, across all the talk, I mean, just feel free to interrupt me whenever something's not clear. Uh, I'll be more than happy to to, to spend more time uh, explaining stuff. Um, right, so basically, as long as, um, uh, is there a question? Yeah. yeah, so the motivation was that uh, one of the parties can go offline, right? Now the party that is randomly picked, uh, that party mm -hmm. also can go offline or mm -hmm. deny service, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, Right, so so uh, I mean you can. So, I guess you're thinking like if there's some corrupt party that doesn't want to speak and just doesn't do anything, is that your 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 question? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess you can like time out or something and then just pick some other party, and I guess eventually you you'll find a party that does want to speak. Uh, uh, I, I guess yeah, that would so be like this. Is, they, we don't consider this scenario. That's true. Uh, we don't consider this scenario. I guess this is like abstract away, but I think a time a timeout would work. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So 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 and so what they show is that essentially, if you corrupt, say, a strictly less than half of the parties, right, uh, then you can basically do um, secure MPC in this setting, assuming that the role selection mechanism is uniformly random. Okay. And uh, so this kind of brings us to our work where basically we consider this modification of the original Yozo setting where we just replace IID random corruptions by static chosen corruptions. And we're gonna just focus on this very specific problem of public randomness extraction, or maybe in other words, you know, public coin tossing. Uh, so let me just kind of explain in more detail what I mean by this. So let's say as an example, we have here uh, four parties, okay? that are gonna be executed in sequence. And before the protocol starts, we allow the adversary to corrupt a chosen subset of the parties. Let's say in this case, it just corrupts two parties. And the protocol proceeds as before, okay? So the first party is executed first. Uh, it can broadcast a public value, uh, can send private messages to later parties. And then it goes to the second party, which is corrupted. So it can deviate arbitrarily from the protocol. Uh, and then it goes to the third party, and to the fourth party. And so we see these public values x1 through x4. And the way we want to toss a coin or generate a random bit is by applying some deterministic function. So we call it, say, an extractor 
that takes as input is x1 to x4, which are the public values, and ideally should be statistically close to uniform. Okay. And the reason why we want that this extractor basically only depends on the public values is that we'd like that anyone that didn't participate in the protocol to be also be able to compute this coin in case they need it. Right. So you could have like the protocol that's um, among just a few set of parties or a few set of roles, but then this generates a, a coin that's going to be used by many people. OK. All right, so I guess one, uh, one sorry, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is random to whom? So uh, the parties in the protocol anyways know the all X is right. So they know they can distinguish from yeah. uh, the extractor output and uniform. Yeah, they just OK, so so, so I, I guess what I mean by this is that uh, I mean, no party can, of course, influence the value of the coin. So, so no matter the adversary, right? Okay. So I mean, this is not like secret or anything. It's really just you just want to toss a coin that's like close to uniform, but there's no privacy or or any type of requirement like that. Yeah, but, I mean, of course, they don't know the value of the coin, right? But yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's clear. Thanks. OK. Good, good question. So, right. So I guess the, the, the most natural question one can ask right now is like, you know, why why are we studying worst case corruptions, right? And I think to me, uh, one one simple justification is that, you know, previously um, we had assumed that the role selection mechanism was perfectly random, right? Selecting parties uniformly at random, but this may not be the case. So it could be the case that the role selection mechanism for some reason uh, is biased, maybe towards the adversary, right? Because think that this role selection mechanism is implemented by some sort of uh, proof of work uh, blockchain, right? So in this case, you know, the, the adversary could commit to spending more resources at certain points to make sure that he has higher probability of corrupting a certain party. And uh, this is bad because this breaks, uh, this would break previous protocols. So, so I guess studying worst case corruptions is a clean way of, of addressing uh, these biases that can arise. Uh, the second is that because we're doing uh, wor wor worst case corruptions here, is that this allows us to go or this actually forces us to go uh, beyond uh, round-based MPC techniques. We can not just use, say, a committee-based protocol design, because maybe with random corruptions we could, be, right? Because if you have, a, you have a committee, you know that with high probability you're going to have a strict, honest majority, right? But with, with chosen corruptions, this is no longer the case because the adversary could just choose to concentrate his corruptions uh, inside this committee and make it have a dishonest majority. OK, and third, I think from our perspective, it's also a very clean model and we think, you know, it may find uh, nice applications in the future, like additional applications. And finally, uh, and this is maybe of interest to me, is that this is actually closely related to some other randomness extraction settings that have been uh, studied recently. OK, so and yeah, so so I guess I guess to maybe put that in context, let me just give like a super brief and very incomplete overview of what's been happening in multi-source randomness extraction over the past maybe 40 years. Um, so this is a topic that's you know it, it, it has gained a lot of interest, and there, there are many applications throughout cryptography. Um, and so the idea of multi-source randomness extraction is that you have several sources of randomness. Someone no had a question. Anirudh, can you please oh. just unmute us? Yeah. So, so let's uh, not raise hands because uh, Zhao is using the full screen mode, right? So he's not going to see. So just unmute yeah, us. Sorry about question. that. Uh, no, okay. that's good. Yeah. yeah. So uh, my question was about the point you made about the uh, round based MPC technique. So you're saying mm -hmm. that if you had a committee based uh, MPC protocol, then uh, in this model, you would assume that certain committees could be could have like pretty much all corrupted parties, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so uh, you so you, you're not really considering that every committee has like uh, I guess worst case corruptions rather than all the all the parties have worst case corruption. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so I, I guess if you if you decide to say concentrate corruptions in one committee, then of course your budget goes down. So you'd have probably you'd have maybe more. Uh, you know, honest committees later on, but then the question is like, does that is that sufficient to kind of recover your protocol and kind of make it okay again, right? 
but the, I guess my point was just like if you if you have a protocol that's designed based on like every single committee being having honest majority, right? Then this won't work. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Any uh, more uh, questions? Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. When is the worst case corruptions? Do you mean static corruption? Yeah. Sorry, I mean static. Yeah. When I say every time I, I'm. I might say worst case later on, but like, yeah, what I mean is like static chosen corruption. So before the protocol starts, the adversary commits to corrupting a set of a subset of parties. Yeah, yeah. and it it'll be nice. That's a good question, right? Uh, so our protocols, uh, we never we never really thought much about adaptive corruptions, but it would be nice to you know get protocols that work for for adaptive corruptions as well. Okay. okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's an open problem, I'd say. Um, yeah, we never thought much about it. Right. All right. Um, yeah, any more questions? All right, so I'll just go on. All right, so yeah, like I was saying, just to put things in context, let me just link this to this notion of like multi-source randomness extraction. Uh, it has a very long history, very cool applications throughout all of computer science, more mostly theoretical computer science. And right, so. In a very general manner, multi-source randomness extraction is just the problem of like extracting a random string from multiple sources of randomness that may have some structure, right? So in the 80s, I mean, this problem goes you know back, way back maybe to the 50s, but in this incarnation, is mostly comes from the 80s where people studied you know maybe independent sources with just some mean entropy, or they they, they studied bit fixing sources where you may have like several uniformly random bits, and the adversary can, without seeing the good bits, fix uh, a subset of bad bits. And more recently, uh, I think people have started studying some notion of like of um, multi-source uh, randomness extraction in settings where these sources actually have a lot of dependencies between themselves, uh, which I think is a really interesting problem. So for example, there's uh, I, a previous work of mine uh, studied the version of this model I just described, but where basically it's still Yozo style, but there are no, mes no messages to the future. And it turns out that actually having messages to the future is actually really important because without them, uh, we cannot extract uh, uniform randomness. So we need to settle for something that's uh, less powerful. Um, yeah, and there's been, I, I think, a lot of uh, great work by other people in this in this direction as well. So let's get back on track. And again, uh, I, I've been talking about these messages to the future uh, without kind of you know discussing how this could even work because you know maybe roles aren't assigned at a time uh, roles aren't aren't assigned to parties at the time these messages are sent, right? Um, so and also, I mean, the the security model for us, right? It really depends on how we model uh, these messages to the future, right? So we're going to consider two models, and these are inspired by some concrete implementations of how this messaging to the future would work in practice. Okay, so yeah, so here's the protocol from before. Again, parties can broadcast public values, send private messages. And the first model we consider, we call it the sending leak setting. And it's called sending leaks because, you know, the sending action actually is going to leak information. And to be more precise about what I mean by this, uh, this means that you know, if you send a message to a corrupted role in the future, then the adversary will learn this message as soon as it is sent. So, for example, if you have party P1 sending a message to party P4, which is corrupted, then the adversary would learn this message already when it is executing party P2, which is corrupted. Uh, sorry, I have to interrupt you. No I feel like I'm in the middle of a very bad board game where I'm not understanding the rules. So <laughs> there are too many. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit confused. Yeah. So see, there are parties and then there are roles. And then you said the yeah, number sorry of parties about that. Yeah, 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 more yeah. than the number of roles. Yeah, let me just explain from the beginning. Like, you know, can you just give like a, you know, summary of whatever I have to, like whatever we need to know so far? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sorry, I, I've been mixing parties and roles. So, so what I mean, so what you see this, four things you see on the screen, these are roles, right? P1, P2, P3, and P4 are roles, okay? This is just another name for parties in this sequential protocol, okay? 
And the way you so the way you you execute these roles is that you would pick some party from a large ground set and you assign it to run the code that's defining some role. Okay. So can I can you assume that anybody who's playing is essentially you know has a role? That's all you mean? A party who's yeah. Playing? So you can like yeah. So usually we we abstract away this ground set of parties from which we okay. pick parties to execute roles. So it, now we just look at you know this sequential protocol. Okay, right. got it. Yeah, that's the um, mm -hmm. so party has some private input also. Is it? Uh, um, not as I mean here, no, there's no private input. Uh, but yeah, if you want to, okay. if you want to say implement some functionality where there is some private input, then I think the way you would do this is that you'd have to have some extra roles where these roles give input. That and there are some roles that compute something, and then there are some other roles that give the output. But here we just focus on this very simple model of uh, coin tossing right so there's no there's no 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 input it simplifies so, so it basically uh, we are just uh, probabilistically juggling between the honest execution and code of execution of some kind of same code yeah 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 i think same if i understood your your question correctly yes i, I think so yeah okay uh, one more question. Uh, when you say if the messages to the future, are they similar to the uh, time lock puzzles, TLPs? Yeah, so for I guess that's one way to implement it, right? Maybe you could say, well, you know, I'm going to, the way I'm going to send this message is maybe, well, you need to be a bit careful, right? Because this message is, is intended to a certain role in the future. You do, you're not, you're not, you do not send to every role, but you can say, I'm going to send a private message from role number one to role number four. Okay. Um, so in this oh. case, you could maybe publish a time lock puzzle or something, and maybe send an opening or or um, yeah. But that's with time lock puzzle. I'm not sure exactly how you would do it. It's something like a time lock puzzle meant for only a certain uh, party or certain role. Yeah. So if 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 you wanted the message to be for everyone, right, all the future roles, uh, then you could just publish the time lock puzzle, and um, you know maybe after some time you can also publish the opening, or you could just say you know. Uh, these parties will, can break the puzzle by themselves in a certain amount of time, right? Um, okay, yeah, thank you. No worries. Yeah. Um, right. So, so the way I, I guess so 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 just I guess describing again what I mean by this sending leak setting. So, again, so we need to kind of decide when is the adversary going to learn uh, the the contents of private messages and the send, in the sending leak setting the adversary will learn uh, the the contents of a, a message that was sent to a corrupted role uh, as soon as the message is sent so like i said if you have role number one send a private message to role number four and role number four is corrupted then as soon as the message is sent, the adversary learns it, which means that when it is executing role number two, it already knows the message that was sent from role number one to role number four. Okay. Is it, is it clear? Sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the way you could maybe see why why this is reasonable, you could imagine that the way private messages are being implemented is there's there's some sort of uh, public key, secret key pairs going on here. And maybe these are attached to role number four, and the adversary, sorry, the, the role number one, in order to send a message to role number four, it encrypts this message with using the public key, and then role number four can just uh, decrypt the ciphertext. Okay, and uh, it is uh, one one of the question is it's not really leakage in the sense that the adversary learns the entire message that is sent. Yeah, the adversary learns the entire message. Okay, okay, fine, fine, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because in this case, you could see that, like, you know, the adversary knows all the secret keys from corrupted parties. And so you could just, like, decrypt any time as, as soon as they're sent. Right? Because sending is like you would broadcast the encryption. Okay, okay, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, um, right. So this is our strongest adversarial setting. So as soon as messages are sent to corrupt, corrupted roles, they are revealed to the adversary. But I think it's also reasonable to consider another setting, which is maybe not as strong, um, and which we call the execution leak setting, because uh, the idea is that only 
you only get the messages when you execute a certain role. Uh, so what this means is that you know, the adversary would only learn the incoming messages to a corrupted role when this role is executed. Okay. Um, so just to clarify, so in this case, if you know if role number one sends a private message to role number four, which is corrupted, then in this setting, then the adversary would only learn this message when it is executing role number four. And so wouldn't know this message when it is executing role number two. Okay, makes sense. Okay, and the way, I guess the way you could see why this could be reasonable is that you can imagine, again, some public key, uh, secret key pairs, but now imagine that the secret key is like secret shared among some committee, and this committee would then, at the execution time, reconstruct the secret key to the relevant role. And then again, you would have the same thing. So you would just publish the encryption of the message under the public key and the role number four would then decrypt at execution time. Does it make sense? Do you want me to go over something again? It's perfectly clear to me. Did anybody else have any okay. questions? Bhavna, do you have questions? I see your mic is unmuted. No, no. Yes. Okay, cool. No, my yeah. okay. I... okay. All right, cool. Um, right. So yeah, good that these things are 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 clear. Yeah, I I I I I I get your thing. That it maybe it's kind of subtle sometimes. It may be confusing with the model. But uh, yeah, thanks for the feedback as well. No, no, um, no. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to introduce this feedback. It's perfect. No, 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 no. But it is. But it is. It is good feedback as well, right? It is. Okay, it is. Okay. It is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like I, and I do mean that it, 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 it's really good. Okay, so, <laughs> okay. so let's uh, let's continue. And right, so what is our main question? Right, I think our main question is quite natural. So we have these models, right? And we just want to understand, you know, what is the maximum corruption rate that we can handle and still get uh, low bias randomness extraction or you know public coin tossing in both of these models? So sending leaks and execution leaks. Okay. And yeah, Oh, sorry. Yeah. What is low bias randomness? Are we not extracting uh, statistically close randomness? Yeah. So when I say low bias, I mean close, close to uniformly random. Where I uh, hear close is very. Right? I haven't. I have never spent. Sorry. That's statistical, right? I mean, that's not usually usually referred to as low bias. Or do you mean something else by low bias? No, I do mean that. Like you, you can imagine, like bias. To me, at least, is uh, you know how far. So, what is the probability that the coin is going to, is going to be equal to one, right? Then the bias would be that probability minus half, uh, maybe absolute value uh, there as well. So, by I just mean that low bias is just another name for statistically close to uniform. Yes. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Fine. Okay. All right. Um, so let me and you know we have this question. So I guess. You know, we can start by trying to do something very simple. Okay, the simplest thing I guess you could imagine doing, which is, you know, maybe let's start with what we know very well, which are round-based protocols, and try to convert that to Yozo, right, and see what we get. Okay, uh, so let's say we have, for maybe concreteness, you have an n-party R-round protocol secure against, you know, delta and corruption. So a, you have a corruption rate is delta. Okay. Uh, how can you get a Yozo protocol from this? And the idea is that we can actually emulate these rounds in Yozo. Okay, so we have again R rounds. So we make R copies of each party. Okay, and in, we have R blocks, and each block is going to emulate a round. So in this case, the first block emulates round number one. And then what you do is you just use these secret messages, right? These private messages to future roles to have the party PI in the Jth block to send a secret state to party PI in the J plus one's block. And in this way, you can just, you know, keep sending the secret states and you would emulate all the rounds. And this would work, like it gives you some coin tossing protocol. But there's a catch, which is that now the corruption rate that you can tolerate, at least, you know, in general, uh, decrease from delta to delta over R, where R is the number of rounds. Okay, so you paid uh, a factor of, of the number of rounds. So to be maybe more concrete, let's say we have three rounds and we have one third corruption rate. Uh, if you convert this to Yozo, 
then you'd get a protocol that's only secured against one over nine corruption rate, because that's one over three uh, times three. Does it, is this clear? Yep. No, this thing of why did the corruption rate decrease is not clear yeah. to Right, so, so because you note that the number of roles is number of parties from the original protocol times the number of rounds, right? Because you have yeah. N parties per block and you have R blocks, okay? And yeah. the reason why the corruption rate decreased is that I claim that you still can only handle uh, T corruptions. So then some number of corruptions that you could handle uh, uh -huh. the round base, okay. because the idea is that you know, you, you have these chains, so for for every party 1 to n, you have these chains. You have like P11, P12, P1R, right? This is like the chain for party 1. And at least naively, if you corrupt at least one of the parties in this chain, you basically have to assume that the whole chain is corrupted. Okay, okay. Yeah. And so once you do this, uh, you really cannot handle... So although the number of parties essentially blew up from n to n times r, the number oh. of corruptions you can handle stayed at T. So stayed at delta N. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. thanks. By the way, I'm not claiming, I, I, I think it's also a very interesting open problem to maybe, you know, assume some more structure on the starting round-based protocol, right? And then try to see if you can get some better compiler for this. Okay. Yeah, but I'm just saying that naively, at least, uh, we, we, we don't know how to do better uh, than this compiler. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, first okay. of all, I like the idea of emulation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. I think it's a very, it's, it, it, it leads to some very nice questions uh, that are still, uh, I guess, unresolved. We do think about it a bit, but they're still unresolved. Um, right, so I guess the natural question, you know, you have this naive approach and now you're going to say, okay, you know, can you do better? And if you can do better, then how much better can you do? Right. Um, so that's exactly what we kind of studied. OK, so we have both positive and negative results uh, with respect to positive results. Um, so in the sending leak setting, which is our strongest adversarial setting, um, we get a zero error um, randomness extraction protocol uh, against T corruptions with 60 plus one rolls. And what this means is that our corruption rate is roughly one over six, the corruption rate we can handle. Right? And before we, you know, the naive approach gives one, one over nine. So this is an improvement. And if we're willing to settle for the weaker adversarial model, which is execution leaks, then we can actually improve the number of roles from 60 plus one to 5T. Okay, so the corruption rate goes from roughly one over six to roughly one over five. Okay. And the way we very, very high level. The way we do this, like we, we create a Yozo style version of Willy Maurer's uh, secure MPC made simple uh, verifiable secret sharing scheme. And I'm going to explain this in more detail. Uh, and we just combine this with some Yozo specific techniques uh, to get improvements on the number of roles. Okay. And to complement this, um, we also proved that if you want to, so randomness extraction with error or bias lower than say 1 over 100 or 0 0.01 um, is basically requires 4t plus 1 rolls. So you, you cannot do um, randomness extraction uh, with corruption rate larger than 1 over 4. Okay. And so for the, I mean, so, so we still have a gap between our positive results and our negative results, uh, except when, you know, the special case where you just have one corruption, in that case, we know that the optimal number of rolls is 5. Okay. Any but, any questions about this? Yeah. Yeah. So this bias has to be something negligible in the parameter, right? Statistical security parameter or something. Yeah, so, but what we're saying, like, even if you just want, say, sub-constant bias, right? Because you, know, okay. you, you could have, you could set it to be whatever. But like, you say, I just want, you know, bias, you know, zero point zero zero one. Okay. And I'm telling you, you know, you cannot do that. Unless you have at least four T plus one parties, so for even forget about negligible, just doing sub constant, you need four T plus one. I see. I see. And any idea about negligible? How many parties you need uh, for negligible? Yeah, I don't. I don't. That's a good question. I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think. At least with our techniques, you cannot get any improvement by just considering negligible. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. 
Okay, so maybe let me, I'll just explain like a bit of our uh, randomness extraction protocols. So let's start, you know, this protocol that we have in the sending leaks model, and I'll, I'll explain a suboptimal version of this, so a, a version that's not like our final result, but it is, I think it already highlights our main ideas. Okay, so here's the result again. So we build this zero error randomness extraction protocol that's secure against T corruptions uh, in the sending leaks model, and we use 60 plus one volts. So we have corruption rate one over six. All right, again, we take this uh, verifiable secret sharing protocol from William Maurer's paper, which is very nice, and we make it a, you know, a Neozo version of, of this. All right, so how does this work? Okay, so we're gonna have, we're gonna take, in this case, I'm gonna describe a protocol for 60 plus two roles. So one more than what I claim we can do. Um, and the way it works is that we're gonna take these roles and we're gonna split it into two parts. So there's a left part with three T plus one roles and we call them samplers or verifiers. And then we have the right part with again, three T plus one roles and we call them publishers, okay? And very high level idea here is that uh, the idea, we're going to use subsets of samples verifiers to essentially commit to random values, and then we send them to the publishers. And the publishers are very simple. They literally just broadcast everything they get. And our final randomness extractor, uh, we take some careful majorities uh, out of the output of the publishers, and we then XOR everything together. Okay? And I'm going to explain this in a bit more detail. Um, all right, so the way the protocol works, maybe in more detail, is that we're going to run a procedure in parallel uh, for all sets S um, of size 2t plus 1. Okay, so we're going to consider subsets of samplers verifiers of size 2t plus 1, and we're going to run some procedure in parallel. Okay, um, so how, do, how, how, would, how would it work for just one fixed set? Uh, the idea is that we take the first party in the set, in this case is P sub I1, and we have this party or this role um, um, sample a bit uniformly at random, and it just sends this bit to everyone else, to all the other samplers verifiers in the set. Okay, and then you go to, say, the second party, right? And this party just forwards uh, whatever E received from party one, okay? and so on. And of course, if you have a corrupted sampler verifier here, you could choose to send different values uh, to different future roles, right? Uh, so we need some sort of consistency check to make sure you know there's no like adversarial behavior going on. And the consistency check is very simple. So if you're in you know role J, you just look at all the values you received, and if they're not all the same, then they're not like null equal. You say, okay, you know, definitely something is going wrong in this set, right? There's some adversarial behavior going on, so I'm just going to complain about the set, and the procedure will just abort, okay? Otherwise, if you know all of these values are indeed equal, you send in the equal maybe some value z, you just send the z to all the publishers, like so, all the publishers indexed by this set, so p prime i1 up to p prime i2 t plus one. OK, and you do this for all, all the samplers verifiers on the left. So now, what does a publisher see? Well, the publisher just sees all these values uh, that were all these Z values that were sent by the samplers verifiers. And he just literally just outputs the majority of what he sees. OK, and all of the publishers do this. So they look at what they got from the samplers verifiers and they just output the majority of what they received. Okay. Um, all right, so now we need to extract some random bit from this. And the, our first step is to, we're going to basically um, compute a value associated to this set. And the value is pretty simple. So if there was a complaint, we just set this value to be zero. And if there was no complaint, we just take whatever the publishers uh, broadcast and we just take the majority of that. Okay. And in the end, our final coin will just be the XOR over all these sets that we did this procedure in parallel for of this uh, bit W sub S. Okay. And I understand that you know this is kind of complex. So let me just give a high-level idea, some key properties about why this works. 
And maybe you can also get a better idea of why things work this way. So the first property is that if you look at this set S of samplers verifiers, then every such set has a strict honest majority because the set has size 2t plus 1 and we only have t corruptions. Okay. And the second property is that if this procedure for a given set S did not receive a complaint, right? Then my claim is that all honest parties in this all honest samples verifiers in this set S, they all agree on the same value. Because if they didn't, then there would be some consistency check that would fail and that honest party would complain. Right. And then finally, uh, something very important is that there is a special set S star such that basically all parties, all samples verifiers, and all publishers that are associated with the set S star, they're all honest. And what this means is that you know, the value, the random value that they're going to commit to uh, through with this procedure uh, is going to be uniformly random and hidden from everyone, from all the corrupted parties. Okay. And so this implies that, you know, the value that we end up with this W sub S star that we end up with will indeed be uniformly. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry, question? quick question. So yeah, can yeah. you give some intuition on why this third property is true? Of S star? Yeah, so so I mean you have t corruptions among both the publishers and the samples verifiers, right? Um, so I guess you could you can basically argue that worst case um, you would put all your corruptions on one side, and you got still it, have like it. okay, 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 yeah, 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 sounds good. Uh, yeah, okay. So and for this, it's really important that you have like uh, three t plus one parties on each side. Uh, it's really important. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah. Yeah, because in the in the execution leak setting, we can actually weaken this and still get away with it. But in the sending leaks, we can't because um, we really need to be careful to which publishers we send our values. Because if they are corrupted, you're revealing that value to the samplers verifiers that are corrupted immediately. But this okay, doesn't happen in, in the weaker setting. Okay. So yeah, so there's a special set S star, and my claim is that you know this this value is hidden, and the two properties above basically mean that this um, the the stage with the samples verifiers like all these subsets commit to a value. So either you commit to a specific value or you complain. But the your choice for doing this is completely independent of this uh, value W S star, um, and so this XOR right will be indeed uniformly random. Any any questions about this? Um, I might oh, have mentioned that. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, you mentioned that it's supposed to be three t plus one parties in the samplers, verifiers, and publishers, right? But uh, your n was said to be six t plus one. I mean. Yeah. yeah. So I, it... I said I I I'm just explaining a a slightly suboptimal version of our protocol oh i see, uh, but I see. the okay. idea so the idea so you need to basically remove one party right and how do you do this right. uh, well the way you can do it is is that you have so you let me just go back here quickly um so here we have these 3t plus one part 3t plus one samples verifiers 3t plus one publishers so right. the way you can do this roughly is that you take the last sample verifier then you take the first publisher okay. and you merge them Okay. And this will still okay. Yeah, so this, this basically removes Eric. one of the rules. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. No worries. So, yeah, that's a good question. Um right. Okay. So uh, sorry. I had yeah, sure. um, so uh, you said there exists such a set S star. I think I might have missed it, but uh, why is it guaranteed that such an S star set exists? Right. So Which I was saying that you have you have T corruptions, right? Um, in total, right? So you kind of have to divide these corruptions between samplers, verifiers, and publishers, right? Uh, right? So you can basically see up to some, because of symmetry, your worst case is like you put all the T corruptions on, say, all the samplers, verifiers. Okay. Right. So then you have, you know, all the publishers are honest, right? And you have at least two T plus one honest um, samplers, verifiers. Right, so so this set set S, S star definitely exists, right? You just take all the honest 
um, samples verifiers and you take all the publishers with the same indices. Uh, okay, so because you're considering all possible subsets. Exactly, you're considering all possible subsets. So let me let me make a remark that you know this protocol is very much not efficient. Yeah, that would be exponential. Okay. Sir. That would be exponential. So again, open problem. You know, get a protocol that design a protocol that is efficient in the number of roles. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. That that's a good question. Yeah. All right. Any more questions? Okay, so let me continue. And um, sorry. Um, so uh, so we see we saw this protocol, right? It, it gives us in this case sixty plus two, um, which is an improvement over the naive um, protocol, like this this compiler from uh, round base to Yozo. Uh, but it's you know it's natural to kind of wonder, you know, is this really the best we can do? Can we do better? And usually when you do this, you just kind of try to focus on some very concrete settings and try to improve things there. And so let me just give an example that indeed we can actually do much better. Uh, and I'm just going to give you what, how you can improve on this just for one corruption with a very simple protocol, which kind of has the same flavor. So again, there are samplers verifiers, there are publishers. And here's how the protocol works for five roles and one corruption. So first party samples a random bit, sends to all the publishers. Then second party samples another random bit, again, sends to all the publishers. Uh, publishers just output whatever they received. Okay. And here's how you compute your random bit. Well, first of all, you set y sub one to be the majority of the values that were reportedly sent by P1, y2 to be the majority of the values that were reportedly sent by P2, and then your coin will just be the XOR of these two majorities. Okay. So let me give just a quick explanation of why this works. So we have just one corruption, right? So let's say we decide to corrupt one of the samples verifiers. Let's say we corrupt P2, okay? So if you corrupt P2, uh, we have to decide which values we're going to send to each of the publishers, right? Because we can now, we can lie, so right, you, can send, you can send zero to one publisher, then one to another publisher, right? Uh, but one thing that must always be true is that you must send the same value to two of the publishers. Because there are three of them, you only have two values you can send. And once this happens, essentially you're committing to the value you sent because then we're taking majorities, right? So when you take majorities, whatever you send twice will win. But you chose that without knowing x1, right? Because all the publishers are honest. And so that basically means that if you try to corrupt a sample verifier, there's nothing you can do. Okay, the bit will indeed be uniformly random because your actions will be independent of X1. Um, so now the other case is when you try to corrupt one publisher, okay? Uh, but here again, there's nothing you can do, but because let's say you corrupt P prime three. Uh, so you can lie about what you got from each of the parties, P1 and P2. Um, but P prime one and P prime two are honest. P1 and P2 are also honest. So they're going to report correctly what P1 and P2 sent. And these two sent the same value to everyone, and these values are uniformly random. Um, so again, majority will enforce that you know whatever you decide to do with p prime three doesn't influence these majorities. And so again, we're in the we we get a uniformly random bit. Does this make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. So 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 we have this protocol. So now. You know, before we said, okay, you need 60 plus one roles, which means you need for one corruption, you need seven roles. But now I'm saying, okay, actually for one corruption, we can do five roles. So then, you know, can we generalize this? Can we make this work for, you know, many more corruptions? And the answer is that yes. So we're able to kind of generalize this idea, but only in the execution leaks model. Okay. So we generalize this idea, combine it with this previous idea we had for the sending leaks. And in this case, we can improve the number of roles from 60 plus 1 to 5t. And when t equals 1, we recover exactly this protocol I just described to you. Okay. And so let me explain in more detail how this would go. So again, same flavor. We divide parties into samplers, verifiers, and publishers. 
But now note that the number of parties changed, right? So previously we had 3t plus one sample verifiers. Now we just have 3t minus one. And this is the crucial part and I'll explain it in a bit. And second, we had 3t plus one party, 3t plus one publishers before. Now we have 2t plus one. And the reason why you can do this is just because we went from sending leaks to execution leaks. And I'll also explain that in more detail. Right. So how would this work? It's kind of the same idea as before. We look at all subsets of size, in this case, 2t minus one, uh, instead of 2t plus one, which we had before. And we're gonna run this procedure in parallel, this kind of commitment procedure, okay? So again, we have here all the roles that correspond to this subset. And we do exactly the same what we did before. Uh, so first party samples a random bit, forwards to everyone else, all the other samples verifiers, second party forwards whatever it received and so on. And there's of course this consistency check that just checks that everyone, like that th this party is indeed seeing all the same bit all the time. If not, it complains and the procedure reports. If yes, you just send Z to all the publishers. And now note that these are not just the publishers that are indexed by this subset, but this, this is literally all the publishers. And the reason why this is fine is because we're in the execution leak setting. So even if some of the publishers are corrupted, uh, this doesn't mean that whatever you send to them is revealed to samplers verifiers, okay? Because the publisher's stage happens at a later stage of the protocol, okay? So now as before, you know, publishers, you know, look at what they got, just output the majority. This happens for all of them. Again, you, you, you need to compute this W sub S and if S received a complaint, you just set it to zero. If, if S didn't receive a complaint and you take majority, this will, this will should work out fine, except we don't have strict on this majority anymore in the subsets, but I'll explain how you can get, get around this. Uh, and finally, you take the XOR over all sets. Um, so again, let me just give a quick idea of why this works. So the key property is that first, um, just as before, every set S has a strict honest majority, but now only if there are at most T minus one corrupted verifiers. Right, because if there are, if there are T minus one corrupted verifiers, then there is indeed the honest majority because two times T minus one is strictly smaller than two T minus one. Okay. But we run into problems if there are T corrupted verifiers. So we kind of need a different argument in that case. Okay. Um, again, if S did not receive a complaint, then all honest uh, samplers verifiers uh, agree on the same value. Okay. Um, and finally, there is a set, this special set S star, such that all samples verifiers indexed by this set are honest. And so this means that this value that's uh, committed to by this set will be hidden from all the other corrupted parties, which means that if you look at W sub S star, again, this will be uniformly random, independent of all the, the other W sub S, and so the XOR will be uniformly random as well. Uh, okay, so this works fine if you assume you have at most T minus one corrupted verifiers, so we just need to handle the case where there are T corrupted verifiers. Uh, but this case is actually relatively simple because if there are T corrupted verifiers, then all the publishers are honest. And so even though you don't have honest majority anymore, anything you do in the sample verifier stage, uh, you do it without knowledge of WS star, right? And so whatever you decide to do, you won't be able to basically influence this because again, WS star is independent of all the subsets that contain corrupted parties. So that's why it still works if you just if you if you decrease the number the set the size of the set so that you still you don't have strict honest majority uh, at all times. Any questions? So let me well, carry this on. Makes sense. Oh, sorry. This makes sense. Okay, good, perfect. All right. So uh, let me just also kind of quickly cover the impossibility result. And let me just remind you what, what we proved. So, you know, we, we gave this feasibility result. So you have corrupt, you can do, you can handle corruption rate one over six in the sending leaks model, which is the strongest. Uh, you can handle one over five corruption rate in the execution leaks, which is weaker. 
And now we prove that uh, if you only get, say, sub-constant error, then actually you need a corruption rate to be at most one over four. Okay. Um, so yeah, so here's uh, just a quick uh, summary of our results. So if n star is the, in the, the smallest number of rows for which you can handle t corruptions, then for sending leaks, you have n star somewhere between 40 plus one and 60 plus one. Execution leaks, we get something between uh, 40 plus one and 5t. And again, open problem to close this gap for in both settings. OK, so let me give just a very rough idea of how an impossibility result works. And I'm going to give just first a, a, a simple, simpler scenario where we just want to prove impossibility for three roles and one corruption. OK, so what's the structure of the protocol again? So P1 broadcasts public value X1, sends private messages to P2 and P3. P2 broadcasts some X2, sends private message to P3. P3 broadcasts some X3. And you'd compute the coin as a deterministic function of X1, X2, and X3. Okay, so the way we're going to try to prove impossibility is that we're going to curl parties one by one, and we're going to see what properties should the protocol have, uh, so that you know we cannot corrupt the pro we cannot bias the coin by corrupting a specific party, and we're going to get a contradiction in the end. Okay, so we're going to look at P3 first, and my claim is that. Um, if there are two values, say x30 and x31, such that if you plug them in into the extractor with these specific values of x1 and x2, you get either 0 or 1, uh, then you can bias the coin. Because then this means that if you corrupt p3, you can just literally choose the value of the coin, right? If you want the coin to be 0, you just, plug, you just broadcast x30. Or if you want the coin to be 1, you just broadcast x31. Right. So what we conclude from this is that if you want this strategy not to work, it must be the case that with high probability, uh, the x1 and x2 should fully determine uh, the coin. Okay. Okay. So now we move on to p2. Let's try to see what happens if we try to corrupt p2. So what what is a kind of a natural strategy we could have for trying to corrupt p2? Well, I could say let's have p2 in its head. Um, simulate two honest runs of the protocol. So the way you do this is he, is he <clears throat> samples his public message twice. Uh, and he sees, and the idea is like, because of this property in green, that x1 and x2 fully determine the output with high probability, uh, it can accurately predict uh, what's going to be the final coin on each of these two runs that he's simulating. So if these two runs are lead to different values, you can just choose his favorite one. So you could choose maybe x20 leads to 0, and x21 leads to 1. You could just say, OK, I'm going to choose x20. Uh, and I'm pretty sure this is going to, the coin will be 0 once I do this. So this biases the coin again. And so what happens? So what's the, pro the property that we need uh, for this not to happen is that well, exactly that this shouldn't happen. So with high probability, if, the, if p2, if there are two different runs, honest runs, then, then they basically need to um, lead to the same value, to the same coin. But now we run into a problem, because now we can corrupt P1. And my claim is that, OK, so because of these properties in green, uh, if P1 decides again in its head to just simulate two honest runs of the protocol, uh, it can accurately predict what's going to be the final value of the coin with very high probability. And not only that, but since we assumed that this was indeed a correct coin tossing protocol, then with probability close to one half, these two runs that he's simulating will lead to different coin values. And so P1 can just choose his favorite run. Say he got a run, he knows that a run will have final, final, final coin zero with high probability. Another run will have final coin one with high probability. He just chooses, say, always the run that leads to zero with high probability. And that biases the coin. And now we have no escape because we're, we're at the end of the protocol. Or rather, we're at the beginning. All right. And this biases the protocol. And this basically means that it's impossible to toss a coin with just three rolls when you have one corruption. Yeah. Any questions?
Why does this not extend to four roles and one corruption? Sorry, can can you repeat that? Why does the same argument uh, does not extend to four roles and one corruption? Right. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah you're, you're beating me to it. Let me explain why. OK, so let's say you have impossibility for four roles, one corruption. And I'm just going to be very high level about this. OK, so again, we do the same thing. We go uh, role by role from P4 to P1, and we, we try to see what properties we need for each of these corruptions not to work. And then we'll get a contradiction because we'll be able to corrupt P1. OK, so OK, so here's how the protocol works. So let's say we corrupt P4. As before, you have a analogous property. So X1, X2, and X3 must fully determine the output I probability. Otherwise, P4 can corrupt, can bias the coin. Uh, if you corrupt P3, same kind of same reasoning as I did before, um, that if you look at two honest runs, independent honest runs, they will, they will have to coincide with high probability. Uh, but now the problem is that when you look at P2, so there are two important things that we need to show. So first one is that P2 must be able to influence the final output. And this one is okay. This actually, this is actually true and is okay. The problem here is that not only must this be true, but it also must be true that P2 must be able to predict what is going to get in each run. Because if he can't, then he's not going to know which of these runs is going to is going to he has to choose, right? Although they differ, they, they lead to different results. If he cannot predict, then he's not biasing the coin. And this is a problem oh, because we cannot. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Even P3 was not predicting, right? Why should P2 predict? P3 was not predicting what P4. Oh, P3 was predicting because we have this um, this assumption that basically P4 doesn't matter, right? Because if P4 mattered, you could corrupt P4 and just choose the value of the coin. So, so basically, the behavior of the first three parties uh, determines the coin. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But the problem is that with P3, you so with three parties, this one's a problem. But now there is this thing. So uh, there's a message going from P1 to P3, right? A private message, and P2 doesn't know this message, right? So mm -hmm. this kind of it's tricky and like and, and basically sh shows that at least naively, P2 cannot really predict the path that leads to each of these coins, the values of the coin. Um, so we need to kind of change our reasoning a bit um, and basically show that, you know, even if you kind of resample this message that was sent from P1 to P3, you're still getting the same properties. And this turns out to be true. Uh, but it, this doesn't extend beyond four roles to five roles because there, I guess the intuition is that um, we would have to resample the messages of two parties at the same time. And... Uh, that's problematic because that means that kind of intuitively means you'd have two corruptions and you're not assuming two corruptions, you're just assuming one. All right. Oh. Uh, yeah, but this, I, I just wanted to give a high level idea of what, what is the pitfall for four roles and you need to be careful here, but we still can prove impossibility for four roles and one corruption. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of at the end of the talk. Uh, I just want to wrap up, just kind of go over what we did. All right, so you know, we have this uh, you only speak once model, so Yozo. And uh, the motivation for that was that uh, we want to do stateless MPC to avoid this denial of service attacks. Um, and what we consider is that we, we, we actually considered Yozo with worst case corruptions or chosen static chosen corruptions uh, applied to the specific task of public randomness extraction, or in other words, public coin tossing. The reason why we do this is just because, you know, uh, we, if you consider just chosen corruptions, this means that the protocols are still secure if the role selection mechanism is biased towards the adversary. Uh, it kind of forces us to go beyond these round-based MPC techniques. And it's a clean model that is closely related to some very cool prior work on, on multi-source randomness extraction. And it was also, I guess, our hope that you know, by casting the model in this uh, direction, it would kind of inspire more people from pseudo to, to work on this problem as well, because we think it is a, a very cool problem. Um, okay, so the results we got. So in terms of feasibility, so for sending leaks, we got a protocol handling, uh, with, handling T corruptions with 60 plus one rolls. So corruption rate one over six. Uh, in the execution leak setting, we got a protocol handling one over five corruption rate. 
And we know that you cannot do better than one over four corruption rate. Okay, so open problems, I think they're very clear. So the first one is, as I mentioned before, we of course would like to close the gap between our upper bounds and lower bounds. Uh, the second is that our protocol, since they need to iterate over all subsets of size, either 2t plus one or 2t minus one, they're gonna be, they're gonna have exponential communication complexity in the number of uh, roles. Um, and finally, we, of course, we'd like to extend this to more functionalities, not just uh, public coin tossing. So yeah, I mean, this concludes my talk and uh, you know, thanks for listening. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the wonderful talk, Shaw. Oh, thank you, um, thank you. Yeah, sorry about the confusion yeah. with the roles and the parties. I, I, I understand like the model is kind of hard to grasp. I, I, I understand that. Yeah. Personally, I don't yeah, know. that was a nice talk. Thank you. Yeah, it was a really nice talk. We really, I mean, I really enjoyed it. And it looks like given the number of questions, I think everyone really enjoyed it. Okay, that's good. That That's good. That's good. Yeah. Good to know. And uh, yeah, and it all, and I think, yeah, you, you, I mean, the, the work is really interesting. And, um, you know, and as you said, you know, there are interesting questions to explore. Mm -hmm. um, Definitely. So, yeah, sounds, yeah. sounds good. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? <laughs> Sorry, my son has questions. Oh, no worries. I don't think he'll be asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, there must be some very tough um, questions. Uh, so <laughs> exactly, <laughs> it's his dinner time. Sorry. <laughs> um, cool. Okay. So then, uh, so Mamita, we'll thank the speaker. Yes. Yes. Thank you for uh, yeah. giving the talk, and we'll love to host you again. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I'd I'd yeah, I'd love to, to, to give more talks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Bye, bye. 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 See you. Bye. 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 bye.